I'm going to close my notes so you don't, I'm not reading this. She is courageous. She's, I said this last night about this conference, and I'll say it about Jackie. I love that Jackie is disruptive. That isn't afraid to say things that might be unpopular, to push people to think, to provoke, to challenge. Jackie Hill Perry is a poet, and it comes out in the way she talks, which is why I love sharing the stage with my friend Jackie Hill Perry. Can you invite Jackie Hill Perry to the stage? So my husband's name is Preston, so it's always awkward when I'm <laughs> talking about Preston Sprinkle, because I have to say Sprinkle, and then we get on the subject of why is his last name Sprinkle. <laughs> but anywho, uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I was actually going to be virtual, um, because I just had a baby, but then I felt this, oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> I felt this compulsion to, to be here, and so I am. Um, mainly also because I really respect Preston. Like, he's probably one of, one of top five, my, like, favorite podcaster people. Um, just because he brings so much thoughtfulness and nuance to this conversation that's rare, which is sad. So here we are. Uh, I was commissioned to talk about the gospel in sexuality, and I think typically uh, the way people would approach that subject is to maybe uh, do some type of uh, theological dialogue about Leviticus and 1 Corinthians and Genesis 2 and 3 and all those things, and I think that's beautiful and helpful. But I think you already have that framework. Uh, and so what I come to do is actually to challenge and encourage you individually as sexual beings. Um, a week ago, I did a podcast interview with some really wonderful people. And, uh, oh, hey, girl. And uh, <laughs> one of them, the woo, um, <laughs> asked me a question. And it was something like, what helps you to keep going? And the question was in the context of sexuality, more specifically, how to keep resisting the pull that sexual sin can have on you. Year after year after year, how do you keep going? And in my brief time with you today, I'm going to ask you the same question with some evidence as to why you should keep going. Because this is the thing. We are humans made from and for God with a heart, a mind, and a body that feels all kinds of ways all of the time. And if you're anything like me, you discovered that pretty early in life. Discovered that your body has desires that seem to come out of thin air. Some of these desires we're, we identified, they weren't too controversial. If you were a boy that liked a girl, depending on what kind of parents you had, if they weren't in the SBC, they might have thought it was cute. <laughs> he said, I'm disruptive, and I am. <laughs> if you were a girl that liked a boy, they might have thought it was terrifying. And if you were a girl or a boy that liked the same gender, they most likely didn't even know. But either way, it didn't take you too long in this world to experience what it was like to like someone or something. It took a long time for me to acknowledge my sexual desires because it, it's almost impossible to detach how we feel from what our culture thinks about it. So to feel was to remember how I was supposed to feel about what I felt, if that makes any sense. Meaning when I thought about liking a girl, I also thought about what the pastor said about it. Every time I wanted to watch porn, I was immediately and instantly reminded of this act as being shameful until I stopped caring. I stopped caring about what everybody else thought, so I did what I wanted to do. If I wanted to lust, I did. If I wanted to watch porn, I did. If I wanted to have sex with a girl or try it with a guy, I did until I met Jesus. But the thing is, that kind of hedonism is the air we breathe. Let you tell somebody that you're celibate to the glory of God and they'll look at you like you lost your mind. <laughs> Why? Because the mission statement of the culture is do what thou wilt. Your body is yours, they'll say. 
You, you could do with it whatever you darn well please. We are sexual beings, so it's harmful to deny yourself anything pertaining to your sexual affections. And as much as we don't want to admit it, those arguments wear on us. Not mainly in regards to evangelism, but temptation. Because they are telling us what our flesh actually wants to believe. And I know for a fact. That the fight isn't merely about what the world believes about sexuality, but what we believe about it. Yes, we know that the body was made for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Yes, we know that we are to submit our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. But there are times when what you know still doesn't quench how you feel. And therein lies the tension that all Christians face to let God and not the body have the final say on how we should live. So when I ask the question of what helps you keep going, this is the dilemma underneath that question. Perhaps this is the sin that so easily entangles, keeping us from running the race that is set before us. It is the fact that there is indeed a race that we are called to run. A race that will never be easy. And there are people in this room that are this close to quitting just because their body is tired of not getting what it wants. Before the writer of Hebrews started talking about running races and things, they described a bunch of folk that ran it before. Saints such as Noah, who built an ark because he feared God. Sarah, who received power to conceive because she considered God faithful. Abraham, who lived in a foreign land by faith because he was looking forward to a city built by God. Moses, who endured the anger of the king by seeing the God who is invisible. And I want you to notice two things. One, that everything they endured came with a cost. Two, that God was their primary focus. Consider Noah, who was told by God that he was about to destroy everybody except his family. That this salvation would, however, come by faith, and this faith would cause Noah to believe God and therefore proceed to build an ark, the ark that God told him to build. Meanwhile, everybody around Noah is having fun, enjoying their life. They were eating and drinking and getting married and doing Enneagram tests and uh, <laughs> having CBD lattes. They, they, they just, they were having an easy existence. Noah, however, did not have the same luxury as the world around him. He was busy working to save his life. You don't think it took endurance for him to believe that God was telling him the truth? Especially when it seemed like nobody but him was concerned with judgment. You don't think he saw how relaxed everybody was and coveted it sometime? Consider Moses, who left Egypt twice when he fled Midian and when God used him to deliver Israel. The text says that Moses forsook Egypt not fearing the wrath of the king. Oh, what a cost it is to forsake the powerful and the luxury such power affords. Depending on where you live, it would be convenient to submit yourself to governing powers that legislate certain things regarding marriage, gender, and sexuality so as to enjoy the comfort of being able to keep your job or your friends or your followers, or the members in your church. It comes with a cost to forsake the kingdom of this world, knowing that there is wrath among humans for anyone who would dare say that God is Lord of the body. But despite despite the cost, Moses endured his race by seeing the invisible God. Consider Sarah, who knew God promised to give her a son from her own womb, but who might not have realized that that was going to take a long time. Year after year, decade after decade, she had to deal with the reality that she would not and could not conceive apart from God's power. Listen, therefore, her faith in God had to include embracing God's sovereignty over her body and when he would allow it to function according to its design. Being a sexual being 
with his various desires can frustrate the holiest of saints. When obedience leaves you with unfulfilled longings, year after year, decade after decade. For some of us, celibacy is the call. For others, marriage is, but both come with a cost. Because in both cases, there will always be unfulfilled desires. Why? Because sexuality is a part of our design, but it is not the ultimate aim of our design. The body was made for God, the God who Sarah believed to be faithful. There was a cost <laughs> for the faithful ones. But do you know what makes one embrace that cost? Do you know what helped these saints keep going? Every single one of them didn't allow the cost of their obedience to distract them from the God they were obeying. Noah obeyed because he feared God. Moses endured by seeing the invisible God. Abraham looked forward to a city whose designer was God. Sarah considered the faithful God. This is in the text. This isn't some poetic iteration. No wonder why when we get to chapter 12, the writer doesn't deviate from the God-centric pattern he set forward in chapter 11. He shifts the conversation to his audience, making sure to reiterate who their attention should still be on. The text says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the rate that is set before us. How? Looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. I started this whole thing by asking you, what helps you to keep going? But now I want to change it to, who helps you to keep going? And the answer is, Jesus. I don't know how you've been running, but if you're doing it with, with your focus on everything else but God, you're not going to finish. There is a real spiritual attack in the form of temptation that tells you that one way to endure sin is to sin. If there is sexual frustration in your marriage, some of us opt for adultery or pornography, so as to deal with the constant disappointment or rejection. There are times when we entertain inappropriate friendships as a way to cope with our loneliness. And nobody knows. Because your friendship looks pure on the surface, but you know what it is. You know that the presence of this person calms you, brings you some identity, brings you a level of peace to the point that you no longer even seek God for. You just call them. It could be alcoholism. It could be even social media that all work as a numbing agent for our weary hearts. But as John said, I say to you, little children, keep yourselves from idols. This race will never be easy. But the sin that clings and the weight that hinders must be laid aside. Because whether you realize it or not, that sin and those hindrances is making your run harder. And I'm concerned that there is the possibility that some of us have actually ran that way for so long that we're not even running at all and we don't know it. May God soften every heart and heart and every seared conscience in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The only way to run well is to look at God often. How? <laughs> we know this, don't we? But I'll remind you. There's this book <laughs> called the Bible. In it is 66 other books that all point to and describe and explain and exalt God. 
in ministry, it's typical that this book, the Bible, so quickly becomes a tool or a mere resource, but it is alive. It is a sword. It is a message, and it will speak to you a new thing with the same words. Read it to see his kindness. Read it to see his beauty. Read it to see his holiness. Read it to see his faithfulness. Read it to remember what he thinks about you. Read it to remember what he thinks about the world. Read it to remind yourself what has come before. Read it to remind yourself what is going to come. Read it to see Jesus. But not only that, you got to actually believe what it says. We have enough people in the church that are well equipped to handle a passage exegetically with no evidence of them living it historically. No wonder we have so many pastors that are abusive. We must believe the Bible. We must believe what God has said about himself as revealed in his son, or we will be no different than demons. Let me read to you what the writer of Hebrews said to folks, or said of folks that were able to do amazing things by faith. He said this, for time would fail me hmm, to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. All of this was done by faith. And if you don't have any, ask God. God gives grace to the humble and living water to the thirsty. Prayer is what needy people do, so do it. Because you do know that Jesus understands what it's like to be you, right? He is both God and man. He was tempted in all respects, yet without sin. Remember that garden where Jesus spoke with God, sweat and blood dripping from his face. He he got repetitive with the father and asked him three times if the cup could pass. And do you know what the father said? Nothing. But do you know what the father did? He sent an angel from heaven to strengthen him so he could do what? Endure. Even Jesus knows the cost of obedience. So what perfect person then is there to help you run your race if not the one who has already done it and excelled at it perfectly? In another place, the writer of Hebrews says this and then I'm done. Since then... We have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. If you are honest, your time of need is always. You have need of endurance, my friends. Some of us have a long race ahead of us. Some of us have a short short one, we just don't know it. But however long the length and however difficult the journey, keep Your eyes on Jesus. Everything in this world wants to distract you from Jesus. Even false teaching is an attempt to show you another Jesus so you don't see the right one. Keep your eyes 
Oh, Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your son. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for the church. We thank you for truth. We thank you for a right mind. We thank you for a willing heart. We thank you, God, that you are so faithful as to remind us constantly of the truth. And so, God, I pray for humble hearts in this place, including mine, that we would want you, that we would delight in you, that we would take joy in you. I pray that we wouldn't even be distracted by all of the chaos within the church and make that that, that, that makes us think about you a certain kind of way. You are good always. You are always holy. You are always loving. You are always just. And so I pray, God, that you would strengthen us through the power of your spirit. I pray, God, that we would rest in the reality that to him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless and blameless before his glorious presence with great joy. I pray for joy today. I pray that even in our weariness, that we would be okay, that we would have a smile, that we would be like Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured. I pray that we would look like you and love like you. In Jesus' name.